Well, good morning. It is December 3rd, and this is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat. Uh, this is our third chat. And uh, so I would like to open this up with, uh, with Hans, Hans van Leeuwen. Now, I'll, I'll open my camera. I've shut down it now. My camera shut off. The camera shut off, okay. So I, just as a uh, reminder to everyone, as far as etiquette is concerned, is it's that, Alma. yeah, we see you, Hans. Yeah, yeah, uh, for etiquette, uh, if you're speaking, please turn on your camera. And if you're not speaking uh, to help conserve bandwidth, please turn off your camera. So uh, so I see like Pal and, and we can also see, uh, we can see Nick. But if you're not speaking, uh, please turn off your cameras and mute yourself. And uh, if you would like to speak, anyone is, is anyone can feel free to uh, just interrupt. And if you are speaking, Please try and pause every once in a while so that we can get a chance to uh, just a moment here. And he's making all the noise. There's a lot of noise, yes. I don't know. I think that's somebody from uh, Aquino, Ojo. You see you there? And we have, uh, let's see here. All right, yes, please try to either mute yourself or apply, please try and stay reasonably quiet during the meeting. But, uh, but Hans, why don't you go ahead and explain a little bit about uh, your, your, your website that you found here. I just typed my um, access to my documents. Uh, it's now on the chat interface. It's docs.com uh, slash Hans dash van dash Leuden. If you do that, then you enter a kind of service of Microsoft where you can publish your work. It is a very easy to use, and I use it to publish my documents and so on. Um, the target of my work is to uh, try to investigate the uh, foundation of physical reality and the first levels that uh, are just above of that. And I do this by starting from uh, lattice, uh, a relational structure that was discovered uh, exactly 80 years ago by uh, Gerrit Birkhoff and John von Neumann. And they called it quantum logic. And the nice thing of uh, that discovery is that it gets a realization in the Hilbert space. A separable Hilbert space uh, has a set of subspaces, and exactly this set has the relational structure that was discovered by these two scientists 80 years ago. And so uh, they uh, suggested to use it as a foundation of quantum uh, mechanics, but in fact it is a good foundation of physical reality, of the whole of physics. If you do that, then you uh, you obtain the first levels of physics as a mathematical model. Purely mathematics, but with all kinds of features and phenomena that uh, you also uh, can see from physical uh, by observing physical reality. That is what I did. All right, well, let's just take a look at your website here. So uh, yeah, there are many places that we can go to publish our information. So you're saying docs.com is relatively recent. Uh, yeah. There are other places, like I keep my, my, my documentations on academia.edu although technically you actually have to be associated with the university to do that. No, no, um, no you, you, <laughs> you need not to be connected with, with the universities. I also publish on, on uh, academia.edu. Uh, uh, I. I publish on ResearchGate and I publish on uh, LinkedIn on several of those uh, scientific groups that are there. 
Yeah, there's also Vixera, which is uh, Vix. Yeah, I use that as as a, a storage. Um, uh, I don't use RXIV because there you need a registration, and uh, in order to uh, be registered, uh, you must have um, endorsement from someone. And I write so uh, controversial articles that I don't want to. Uh, have someone uh, supporting me with the articles that, uh, yeah, he, he must also then give his name as a support uh, for that. So I rather publish on VXRA rather than on RXIV. But uh, in fact, they are similar services. They have a nice revision uh, service. So you can publish an article and publish new versions of it on, on top of them. And that is why I use it. Uh, that's Vixera lets you do that? V-I-X-R-A. Uh, it's it's uh, the two names of these uh, two services are exactly re reversed. Yes. <laughs> uh, Let me see if I can show that. Yeah, Vixera. Yeah, I put, a oh, paper. I put a paper on there too. Yeah, if you're not familiar with all of these possible ways of uh, publishing your information, I think this alone is interesting. So Vixera, you can go and publish basically whatever you want, and uh, no one's going to sit there and act as a gatekeeper for you. Yeah, there is also uh, some, something called HAL that uh, also delivers such a service, but uh, uh, RXIV, and VXRA are both well known, and uh, uh, you, you can uh, find a lot of uh, publications there, papers. And I use uh, only use VXRA because uh, they uh, they do uh, do not uh, uh, require uh, registration. Yeah, I have some pick some papers here as well. Um, but now, how does this compare with the other services? For example, uh, I, I use uh, academia.edu because it actually tracks the number of people who, who view your paper. Yeah, but, um, you, you can publish it there and uh, you, you can uh, store an article there, but um, there are not very m many people that look then at your articles. And uh, RXIV and VXRA are much more in use. They, they publish thousands of articles and uh, they are uh, read by hundreds, maybe also thousands of people. Uh, they are more uh, uh, common. Uh, you can also publish, for example, in ResearchGate, but also there your papers are not uh, read by uh, very many people. And um, I want to use papers in order to uh, be able to discuss on the content of, uh, of those papers. And, and I like to use them as reference papers. Well, let's see here. Well, I'm on, uh, you guys can see my screen, academia.edu. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. So they do have things like, um, so for example, these are my papers, I suppose. Um, Let's see here. Here's one of my most popular. See now on academia.edu, I have a 313 views, but on Vixera, I've got 53. Oh, that's so, that's nice, yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I'm I'm looking also for the places where I can put my papers where they get the most views. Yeah. Um, but it looks like, at least for me, Vixera, I mean, um, academia. <laughs> Academia should work works well, yeah. I, I, I'm not, I'm not so busy people. yet. I, I'm, you can also find me on, on um, uh, academia.idu. Uh, I'm making a lot of noise. Yeah, yeah. I do a lot of uh, publication and, and uh, I put questions on, on ResearchGate. Uh, there are very good discussions going on on ResearchGate. And there are some good discussions going on, uh, some of the groups on uh, LinkedIn. There are some scientific groups 
and link it in that uh, concern physics and things like that. And what I take part the, in them. What was the other uh, link you mentioned? Link it in. Yeah, link, link it in. in. Something gate. Yeah, research, uh, gate. research gate. Research gate. But here, like some of the analytics you can get from academia.edu. And so they can, like, this is showing uh, the number yeah. of viewers that I'm getting per yeah. day. That's and what it, Research Gaze, uh, Gate also does. Uh, you, you can get uh, kind of uh, uh, analytics from them. Could you yeah, maybe so put something up on the website about all these different uh, links? Um, um, not yet. No, I, I, I'm going to probably be summarizing some of these things so that like these are all the places that you can go to publish your stuff and um you know why why should you go to these different places yeah that's a great idea I mean, other people can add to it maybe different discussion groups or whatever have you heard of anti-relativity.com they have uh, certain groups that um, um, uh, that is linked in uh, that you um, can become moderator of uh, a certain group. Where, uh, 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 the moderator has Someone's a, making a, 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 a separate uh, discussion thread under this. There's one about physics, and there is uh, one about theoretical physics, and so are many of those uh, scientific groups uh, active there. There is one group uh, from American Physical Society, APS, and uh, so there, there are many of them. And it is also worthwhile to, to look around there because the, some of these, these discussions are very worthwhile, they're very interesting. Let's see here. Who's making all the noise? Uh, someone on the phone line is making all the noise. Okay, I quieted them down. Let's see here. So who else has used some of these uh, publishing things on the internet? I do it regularly. <laughs> do it regularly? Yeah, very often. How often do you publish a paper? Um, I only uh, publish online. I've tried to publish on, on peer review uh, journals, but um, they cost money and, uh, and uh, it costs a lot of energy and time to, to, to get something uh, published on, online. And, uh, there are, at this moment for just physics, there are about thousand uh, journals where uh, that do the kind of peer review for physical uh, papers. It's uh, it's a complete mesh peer review publishing. So I like better to publish on on uh, something stable like V extra or RXIV. If you if you have endorsement and registration, then it is also a good site. And um, uh, I. I do not need so many places, one or two or three. I have my own website as, as well. Um, that up. Oh, sorry, my, my wife is calling me. I must I must stop this. Uh, I have to go to a family meeting. Next time I join again. All right, well, Hans, thank you very much for uh, getting the discussion started. And we may take a look at uh, your, the other things that you have in your website. Good. Thank you very much. I hope to see you back next uh, Saturday in the uh, next meeting. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Let's see here. So, so uh, I see we have Ikinbo Ojo, and uh, we seem to be getting quite a bit of noise from your from your um, from your link there, and uh, we can't hear you. So, well, actually, I've, it's because I've muted you, because there's a lot of noise coming from your from your camera and your and your audio.
So if you're not speaking, can you please turn off your... Let's see, I can see you trying Hello. to... Hello, Franklin. Okay, we can hear Hello, you Hello, Franklin. Yes, we can okay. hear Just very well, briefly, though. The, I'm available to me. Let me say well done to you, Franklin, and well done also to Bob the Hillstar. Uh, this is uh, Akimbo Ujo, all the way from Africa. We are not many on your forum. I think we are two. Uh, I and one Dr. Musa Bidlai. Um, so that's that. But let me make a comment. Uh, the first one is that um, to promote uh, the activity of your of the forum, uh, a lot of articles are being kept on duly uh, in the moderation and pending uh, categories for too long. I have about uh, three or four comments I have made. They have been in moderation for some months now, and they have not been made available to members to read. So perhaps we should look into that. I hope you are hearing me. Are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. OK. Yes, so some of the comments are being kept in moderation and pending categories for too long. So that's uh, one thing I think um, will help uh, the forum. The other is that um, on the home page, it would be good to have a column uh, where recent posts feature. Uh, right now, uh, some, of the, some of the exchanges I've had with uh, John Eric Persson, uh, unless you go to that topic, nobody actually knows that the exchanges have been going on between John Eric Persson, uh, a good friend of mine again, Cornelis Bave, we've exchanged some um, uh, chats on the website, but unless you go to the topic, forum topic, nobody can really know that the things have been going on. So perhaps you look into that. Um, finally, my own area of interest is um, how to make dark matter uh, restore Galilean relativity to its pride of place. Right now, many critical thinkers are skeptical about dark matter, but uh, historically, um, special relativity came into being when an earthbound medium was difficult to find. When the Mitchell Simonian experiment was carried out, the first explanation that was thought about was an earthbound medium. Uh, when that was not found, then uh, Einstein came up with his uh, theory. But in the 30s, a medium came into reckoning in the scientific world. People uh, started thinking about dark matter. And this is a form of matter that can be earthbound. So why is it that critical thinkers are not looking at that as um, an explanation for the null Mitchell simoli result? That's one. The second thing is that um, like all matter that can be bound to celestial bodies, like an atmosphere, the density will vary with height, with altitude. And if this can vary with altitude, this will have effect on light propagation, either horizontally or vertically. And this can also explain light bending and some of the other results. Um, so I, I, I don't know whether I, wish, I should stop there for now. I might come in again later, maybe for that, maybe allow us to also say something. Uh, well, if you can put uh, your website link into the chat, then maybe we can take a look at that a little bit later on. Okay, no, I don't have a website, but I have some articles I've written. But um, on, well, the, I mean, in, on the... In, Using the, 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 the chat software in the meeting, in the meeting, you can write uh, notes and uh, you can put, okay. you, the, put the link to your website on there so that we can see that, okay. so that we okay. don't have to try and do that. I'll, I'll, watch, I'll, I'll watch for now. Okay. So who else do we have today in the, in the meeting here? So did anyone else would like to make a comment about how you get your work published? So I just put up a slide that I'm working on here of uh, at least four different places where you can get uh, your information published. Let's see here. All right. 
We're still getting a lot of a lot of noise from uh, Akinbo. Yeah, I was going to suggest uh, that uh, we also try to make up a list of uh, where we can find discussion groups that uh, would be sympathetic to uh, uh, dissident, dissident uh, physics ideas. Well, what normally happens is that um, people just make up lists of email lists of people who are interested in discussing things. And then they just send like masses of emails between them. And of course, the problem is, is that once you get on one of these lists, there's pretty much no getting off of it. And, and you get like this huge uh, flood of emails. So let, let me show you an example of that. So let's see here. So for example, um, I'm on a lot of these lists here. And there's just like, uh, this, is, this, this is a discussion that started this week, which is about nothing. And you can see there's this big list of uh, people who are on this email list. So people will create these email lists. And, and then once, once you get on it, then, the, then you get like, uh, you know, bunches of other emails following up on it. And so this goes this goes back and forth. But the problem is, is that if you want to be on these discussions, you basically have to have somehow had someone stick you on the stick you on the list of emails. And like I said, once you do get on it, then you're kind of stuck. For example, uh, right now going on is this uh, ongoing uh, relativity debate. And, and, and there are so many of them, like five or six mails per day, that uh, I just have a filter that just takes them straight to, straight to uh, my relativity folder where, where I don't read them because I just really don't even have time to read them. But Yeah, I was thinking more, more like a forum type, uh, public forum type stuff. Like uh, there's a, uh, University Today has something, but it's you know very uh, mainstream. You know, if you try to print, put in any non-mainstream ideas, you get shut down, <laughs> or or even uh, fizz.org, I think has uh, well, they have space for comments, right? But... Well, I've tried to create places now on the. the Google Groups actually used to be a good place to do these yeah. discussions. Oh, yeah. Um, but, but ever since they changed their format, it makes it almost impossible to have a, dis uh, a reasonable a discussion showing who said what. Well, yeah, so, Yahoo had something too. I, I don't know if I haven't been active in that, in that lately, though. So, right now, I'm showing you. Uh, this is where I used to play out. Play. This is sci.physics on groups.google.com. And uh, there are still interesting topics here. I mean, this is non moderated, so anybody can come in here and post something. Are you familiar with this website, sci.physics on the uh, uh, groups.google.com? I am not, but I'll take a look at it. But yeah, you know, wanna... if, if um, maybe you could get. Uh... Uh, the uh, our our website, you know, publish a list where we can find discussion forums like this. Yeah, well, let's see here. Um, let me just copy that, and I'll throw that into the chat, so you can take a look at that. So that's one place. Although the one the one thing that that I have been trying to look for is a way to be able to manage these email lists. It should be, and I don't know why it's so difficult to find this, that I should be able to create one email address. You know, like if I wanted to create a, a, an email list for all the people who show up to this science chat, I should be able to create that one email. And then when I send an email to that address, it should send it to everybody. And if someone replies back to just that one address, that it goes to everybody. And then I should be able to maintain that list so that people can either be in or out of that. Now, the uh, 
Well, don't, don't, don't all the uh, emails, client support groups? Not in a real easy way. I mean, basically, my the NPA relativity group basically does that, kind of. Uh, but it, it puts together like an abridged version. Um, I can't quite describe why it doesn't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> But the problem is, is that all the people who are in these discussions are usually old and retired, and uh, they don't know how to do anything other than <laughs> to put their name in inside the CC uh, list or the to list on these email messages. But that tends to be a problem. So we have all of these. The other problem is, is that if it's if it's in these emails that are going back and forth, then none of it's getting um, archived. It, they just get basically thrown away. But I have been trying to uh, curate uh, the most interesting messages by sending them to my, uh, and my my this NPA relativity Google group. So as soon as I see something that's interesting, I will forward that, and then uh, then the, then the discussion is kept. Is, is that a, a good group to look at it? Did you mention, did you put that up there in, in the chat? Yeah, let's see here. Well, you would go to the main, the main website is groups.google.com. And then you can search for uh, various subgroups that are in, that are in there. So that's, oh, I thought you, I thought that was part of the NPA site. Nope. Uh, none of these are, none of these are, are part of the NPA at, at all. I mean, there are discussions that uh, within the NPA site itself, they have blogs and, but. Um, it hasn't really gotten active yet, I guess. Some people use them, but there's just a multiplicity of places where you can publish your things. Yeah. So it's good to, I'm just making up a list now so that um, you can see them. All right. So has anyone ever tried to actually submit something to like physical review letters? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so I tried that once and of course I got the summary. Uh, uh, this is not an area that we publish in kind of, kind of letter, right? And that's about as far as you as you get if you try and uh, submit something to uh, legitimate um, peer-reviewed journals. But you haven't even tried, Jim? No, I haven't just tried. For, just for the fun of it, just to <laughs> see what they respond back with you. No. Well, um, I assure you yeah, that would be the respond. I tried in uh, electrodynamics, uh, Galilean electrodynamics, and uh, I got shot down by uh, Cynthia. <laughs> so even within uh, now, electro Galilean electrodynamics, they're more sympathetic to the uh, the dissident uh, science crowd then. Well, they were started by uh, uh, Peter Beckman. It was started by uh -huh. Peter Beckman. Uh, and it was, you know, specifically anti-relativity. And did you have some anti-relativity uh, articles you wanted to publish in there? Well, it's the, it's my it was my Tron theory. It was well written at that point. I, 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 but, but well, with there being so many possible outlets, that's what I'm curious about for people. It's like which one is the best so my opinion just based on the number of reads i get is probably academic at edu because i get the most reads from there and i can tell who's reading it and and when they're reading it yeah i'll give that a shot at least at least i get a good feeling that every single time someone reads my paper i get like an email saying oh good someone read my paper <laughs> <laughs> I'm not no, being completely no. ignored. 
Have you ever heard of OMICS Group? Uh, what's that? Uh, it's some publishing engineering journals. I, they actually approached me to uh, to submit my paper. But the question remains, where do we publish our stuff so that people can see it? I mean, it's kind of frustrating to me that I know that there, like, um, there are people who are reading the stuff that I'm that I'm putting out. If I look at my own website um, uh, statistics, you know, I can get very detailed statistics on exactly who's looking at what picture or what paper, and I can see that people are looking at my stuff, but. Yet nobody writes, no one calls, the Nobel Prize Committee has not knocked on my door. Um, it's, it's like it never happened. So. Yeah. Shouting into the wind. Yep, shouting into the wind. It's probably because we really are just completely crazy, right? <laughs> well, um... I guess I just put that as a distinct possibility. New ideas are uh, hard to get people to listen to. Well, let's take a look at, for example, one of these email threads that's going on. So you can get kind of a flavor for that. So Here, this is, Let's see, you guys can see my screen. So I'm scrolling down through all this stuff here. So this is a discussion which started on <clears throat> December 1st from uh, Roger Munde. And he is saying that, that uh, all the highly complex and convoluted theories uh, to the structure and interaction of the human environment and the universe are based upon nothing. And that, uh, that everyone, it says, as you all seem to accept that it is nothing, that it exists, and that it relegates the real matter that sustains us. But he goes on to say, there's absolutely no proof of the existence of a vacuum filling ether. And, uh, there's no, but yet he goes on to say that there is no evidence that that gravity cannot function in an empty space. And he just uh, starts the whole argument, this whole email thread off this way. <laughs> so I, I'm not exactly 100% sure of, of, of what his point is here. So he sends it out to all these people here, big giant list of like 40 people. And I'm not sure where he gets this list from, but usually people will keep around old lists and they'll just, they'll just start off by, by setting up one. And this is actually one of the smaller lists. I think this only has about 40 people in it. Some others have about 120 people in it. And then we get this nice response back from uh, Verge, I think. And he chimes in on what he thinks about the, the, what space is made out of. And he's saying that uh, it's, it's impossible for us to know the physical properties of space here. And it looks like his his view is that there's a field. He says, I am certain that the field exists. And then it goes on, then Roger Moon re responds back to him. And he makes a comment that uh, energy is synonymous with matter. 
So here, we're, here we, we start introducing that concept that, you know, matter is energy and energy is matter in this discussion. And then he responds back. And then I respond back. And then uh, and there's another response. <laughs> and people use di like different colors when they respond back. So you can tell what their responses are. So this is just um, emails, fly, uh, not really even a, a mailing list kind of? Yeah, not even an emailing list. This is just uh, reply all, gone out of control. Uh -huh. Well, I think uh, the old NPA site had a, a mailing list type of thing at one point. Yeah, like I said, I have been trying to get people to use a mailing list. But basically, they abandon them and just keep on putting everybody's everyone's emails um, on on these on these messages, heading back and forth. Yeah, the other problem is everybody repeating what the the other people said, and you get you can't even tell what who's responding to what when. So what happens is this particular example. So I've forwarded this to my NPA relativity groups. So. I maintain the mailing list here so that anything I forward onto that gets to people. And then you can view what's going on with these emails in this. And so this is what the emails look like in googlegroups.com. But it's a bit hard to read because everybody's uh, messages appended onto everything else. And it's not really in a tree form. But if you want to know what's what's been going on in these kinds of discussions, you could just monitor this this group, or you can make yourself a member of this group, and uh, you can see what's going on. At least uh, at least the mail messages that are moderated by me. And then if you're really brave, you can do a reply all to uh, one of these messages and, and risk getting yourself included in the, the list of uh, emails that people use. <laughs> and then yeah. once, you're on, once you're on the list, then it's uh, almost impossible to get off of it. You know, people, people have tried to just say, please take me off this list. And, and if they're nice, they'll, they'll reply back and not include your name in the list. But there is a good chance you'll get stuck. <laughs> but this is an interesting discussion about basically what space is made out of. And one of the uh, topics of uh, controversy here is this whole question of whether uh, what is uh, matter or mass made out of. So I was wondering, did, and does anyone here have a strong opinion that, uh, say, matter is actually some is actually some kind of like say condensed form of energy? Who here would support that concept? Anybody? Well, I don't. I don't like the idea of. Uh of energy being some kind of a uh, mysterious concept. Uh, to me, energy is uh, either the poten potential to move matter or the movement of matter. Those are the two two approaches. I, I support that uh, energy coalesces into matter, but there are others in the group who, like Glenn Borchardt, who strongly believe that uh, uh, matter produces energy. So does energy produce matter or does matter produce energy is the question. No, no I'm, I'm of the thing, I'm of the thing basically that energy is producing matter. Energy. Um, 
more, more specifically, all energy is basically tension energy. Everything derived from the tension. Anyway, getting an awful lot of noise here. So let's see, Cornelius, you have muted yourself. So yeah, there is this uh, question, but uh, so the, the, the main question is if that uh, matter is uh, some kind of energy, then how does this interchange actually occur? That, is, wanna... that, that is the issue to be just, you know, to be pursued and discussed. Well, what is what is your uh, opinion on that, Lou? How does uh, matter, like say, a electron? So, how does that become energy, for example? What what what? How do you see that happening? I don't see the uh, electron becoming energy. I see uh, energy, whatever it is, as the fundamental substance coalesces into uh, uh, an electron. But I, Viraj has, in this discussion that you just highlighted, Viraj has some proposals for how that actually happens. I'm, I'm not technically proficient enough or mathematically proficient enough to, uh, uh, to have any, any suggestions as to how it occurs. But it, is what, it. But it is what is being discussed. And, I, and that's what, one of the reasons I'm actually participating in the group because is is in pursuit of my interest in in the nature of energy. I don't know if Viraj has has, has directly answered that question, which is uh, how how does it happen? Uh, in in the in the the thread on uh, uh, there there is no such thing as um, um, I keep wanting to say entropy but okay, what is it the words don't come to me quickly um, th there is no such thing as uh, what is it when things just keep going inertia there's no such thing is inertia there's a thread on that and and in that thread uh Viraj has an explanation or a proposal okay yeah there's another whole other thread about inertia yes all right now other th what i've heard possible explanations are is that um say an electron is somehow uh, a vortex. I think I've heard that in the discussion that the the kinetic energy, uh, well, an electron can be thought of like this little spinning vortex. So obviously that has some kinetic energy in it. And then if you break apart one of those things that the that, that kinetic energy then comes out and is released. And in order to make an electron, you have to take all this kinetic energy 
and make it spin around into a tight little vortex. And then that um, becomes your tangible matter is, is one way I've heard of it. Does that sound convincing to anybody? That somehow matter is like this ball of kinetic energy. Yeah. Well, uh, I, as I said, I start with a Brownian motion. That uh, energy is just in constant motion, and it, it attracts and repels. So, in in the process of attracting, it forms, it it coalesces into forces, or it coalesces into into matter. And uh, then the, the, the repelling part of it produces independent structures and independent forces. So just attraction and, re and repulsion are fundamental principles that uh, uh, drive the creation or the emergence. Actually, forces and matter emerge from the constant uh, motion of of uh, energy, which is described in Brownian motion, but also in quantum mechanics. So Lou, what do you think about the concept, uh, I think Cornelius is, or maybe Jim was mentioning, that uh, energy is just either matter in motion or it is potential energy? Uh, wait a second, Franklin. This uh -huh. is Corey. Corey, yes. Uh, I, I do not at all uh, subscribe to the fact that energy is matter in motion. Uh, matter already implies mass, and I have energy is strictly tension in a tension field, and uh, mass and, and matter come from that and emerge from that. It's uh, similar to what Lou is describing, only. Uh, in my uh, view, there is only tension and there is only a pull. And it's all about the direction of the pull and the focusing of the pull. And uh, matter is basically derived from that. There is strictly a wave nature to everything. And uh, all forms of matter and energy can be derived from various wave patterns in that tension, tension field. So say, for example, we have an electron that's sitting out in the middle of space. So uh, how would you describe that in your tension field? You start with the electron. That's one of the most complex patterns there is. You have to start with what what is mass and what has just mass, and that would be the neutron. But I don't think, uh, right now I've, I'm uh, on the road again, and uh, I don't have time to describe that. Uh, there is information in the, on the website uh, there's several uh, voice recordings uh, with uh, Glenn Baxter, and I've discussed it before. Uh, it all begins with understanding tension. The easiest way to study that is uh, to begin by looking at the tension, surface tension on water. Pay attention just to the tension, not to the particles that are created by the tension, but the tension between the particles. Everything is derived from the tension. Uh, like I said, I, I don't really have time to go into it right now. We have had a discussion with Cornelius on, on the uh, email strings uh, a few months ago. We had an extensive discussion. <laughs> and I'll go into depth, too, in how the uh, tension forms patterns that can create mass and then from that create uh, a charge and then from that create a magnetic field from that create light. Uh, that's all uh, just a sequence of operations that occurs and basically all matter and energy are derived from waves in a single ether etheric media that is tensionable elastic media. Uh, but it's all about you know what the patterns are and the patterns have specific characteristics, transverse waves, uh, versus longitudinal waves and their combinations thereof. That's that's uh, the fundamentals of it. I think you've heard quite a bit of it before. You've been in on discussions before, but 
certainly not uh, that the, the concept that ma energy is matter in motion is, is totally wrong because it, matter already implies the existence of mass and I actually derive the, the, the emergence of mass. I'm with Cornelius. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to listen to this recording later. Uh, I'm going to help you get the road. Hit the road. All right. So who, who had that initial comment that um, an energy is uh, mass in motion? That's me. So Jim, what do you think of that, of, of what uh, Cornelius and uh, Lou have said there? Well, I mean, to um, the, the whole concept of uh, energy as being this mysterious uh, entity uh, and that it's equivalent to mass you know, arises, I think, from uh, special relativity, right? Where <clears throat> the idea of uh, when you have fusion or fission, the missing mass is converted into this energy, whatever that is, right? Uh, no, it doesn't come from special relativity. It just, uh, uh, it's it's counter to special relativity. E equals mc squared is, 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 is really where it comes from, isn't it? Well, that E equals mc squared just uh, talks about the relationship between uh, the quantities of, of matter and energy, how much energy is available given how much matter you have. Uh, it doesn't really speak to what comes first and what we're discussing here is what comes, what's more fundamental, matter or energy. And Yeah, well, but E equals mc squared means that at some point when, you, when m goes away, when you, that it becomes E. It, right. it, no, it just talks about if, if you want to know how much uh, uh, energy matter disappears. Are, matter disappears from the universe, according to this, right? Matter comes and goes all the time. I mean, uh, our bodies disappear. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm saying that, that that whole idea arises from rejecting ether. Because if, if, if there is an ether and it's got mass... No, it doesn't. I, I would say that uh, the the energy, fundamental energy substance constitutes the ether, and I think that's what uh, Cornelius uh, believes as well. Yeah, but, so it's, all right, not, but energy, energy substance, you said? I mean, that that sounds a little vague to me. It's yeah, not, well, it is, it is vague, yes. It, it, it has to it has to be. Uh, it, it's not at the point of being scientific. So what I'm trying to say is that if, there's an equal, if there is an ether and it's made up of small particles and we can't, haven't really detected yet, uh, we, and we have a fusion reaction and, and matter is, uh, the, the, the resulting mass of the fused particle less than the uh, protons and neutrons that formed it, that we could say that uh, this, this, instead of this matter disappearing, it just, it just becomes disassociated uh, into the, the particles of the ether with a very high energy that these particles are mixing around and flowing around, uh, moving, essentially, kinetic energy. So there is kinetic energy that's released, but the, but the mass does not really disappear. I think, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, where we differ greatly, Jim, in, that, uh, in the, the ether that we're talking about, the ether doesn't have mass. The mass emerges from the ether as a pattern of tension. Correct. Well, I'm trying to say that... Uh, the perceive as sorry. Mass ...in particles of the focus tension. Uh, so basically, the ether only has a tension characteristic and it's the distribution of that tension that makes the patterns and makes the mass. So that, that's, that's I think, what Lou and I are, are looking at or have been discussing more so. So mass is not inherent. In, the, in your ether, math is in, mass and inertia are inherent. Uh, therefore, it can have uh, momentum. Or, and uh, in ours, it does not. So is matter real? 
Am I real? <laughs> well, when you come right down to it, if you if you, if you could put, hold an uh, an electron in your hand, would it be like a marble that you're holding in your hand, or or would it be this ghostly thing that uh, if you blew on it, it would disappear? Maybe it's a fuzzball more than a than a marble. Can I, can I ask the course? Where does it where is it derived? Ask a question. Ask a question on the matter topic. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, yes. um, According to current cosmological um, concepts, um, it's estimated that we have about 10 raised to the power 52 kilograms of matter in the universe. Of course, not everybody believes in the Big Bang theory, but those who believe in it, there's currently 10 raised to the power 52 kilograms of matter in the universe. Now, the question, has all this matter always been there, right from the Planck era till date? Or has matter been increasing in quantity right from the Planck era till this time? The evidence for the 10 raised to the power of 2 kilogram is based on a cosmological parameter called omega, which is about a 1, and the, which indicates that our universe is currently flat. So if we have 10 raised to the power of 2 kilogram of matter in the universe now, I don't know whether any members have any have anything to contribute, whether this amount of matter has always been there right from the beginning, or has it been increasing with time? Thank you. Um, energy is conserved, meaning energy is finite, and the amount of energy controls the amount of matter. Because energy is finite, matter is finite, but the amount of matter at any particular time will come and go. Okay, well, um, I've heard what Lou said. Um, there are indices we can use to know that relate the amount of energy density in the universe to the temperature at the early times. Um, by my calculation, um, we'll need about 10 raised to the power minus, 10 raised to the power minus eight kilograms, the Planck mass, a quantity of matter at the Planck era to give a temperature about 10 raised to the power 32 Kelvin. Any amount of matter more than that will distort the Big Bang thermal history. So, uh, and fitting in 10 raised to the power 32 kilograms that we have now to the early era uh, will also distort our thermal history. So I don't know if anybody has um, interest in that, uh, area or is Lou saying to put 10 or 52 kilograms of matter or energy into the Planck size the universe the temperature will still correspond with what the Big Bang tells us thank you well I think and Lou, Lou, Lou is saying that uh, you get what you get to start with but there, there, there can be this interchange between uh, energy and matter within the universe. Now, I'm not quite sure what the significance would be if the uh, amount of matter is increasing or decreasing over time. I hope it doesn't decrease because if it does, if it does then there'd be no matter at some point. No, I think it's increasing. My point is that um, if you fit the amount of mass that we have in, in the universe now, to the small size at the early era, the temperatures will not correspond. The temperatures will only correspond with the Big Bang theory if matter, the amount of ma mass in the universe has been increasing. All right, so you have find some, some evidence that the mass in the universe is in fact increasing. Yes. New land because, is being uh, created. <laughs> Yes, let me give you another example, a quantitative example. If we had 10 of 2 kilograms of matter at the Planck era, the temperature from the energy density would be about 10 raised to the power 47 Kelvin. But most uh, models of the Big Bang tell us the temperature at the Planck time is about 10 raised to the power 32 Kelvin. There are equations to, that relate energy density to temperature. Uh, in the um, 
flat body uh, equations that relate temperature to energy density. Thank you. I, I think temperature, I, I'm not quite sure I'm following all that, that you're saying, or, um, but uh, certainly the loss of thermodynamics uh, and temperature direct uh, uh, much of the dynamics of matter and energy interchange or the, the emergence. Again, it, it's, it's the emergence of matter from energy, the emergence of force from basic energy and then it changes and this this goes back to uh, heraclitus one of the uh, uh, pre-platonic uh, uh, greek philosophers who said that that fire is the fundamental fire meaning energy is the fundamental uh, substance of the universe and it is constantly in motion so this is an old concept Okay, well, uh, maybe I'll have more time to discuss on the forum with Lou. Um, just to point out that the flatness problems that uh, affect uh, our cosmology are an attempt to make sure the universe at the early era is not as dense as supposed to be. And that's why um, an inflationary mechanism was devised how do we contain this 10 to 52 kilogram of mass in the early era? So the mechanism is devised to grow up the universe and reduce this density. But um, I guess we'll discuss this maybe at other uh, opportunities. Thank you. We did have a discussion, I think time before last about um, uh, missing matter, which, and, and we, you get in, in smaller uh, physical chemical or material structures, you have the, the uh, mass deficit. In other words, that the mass of the components of a structure is less than the mass of the completed structure. So where did that mass go? And the answer is i think that it that the mass is is energy that has has uh, is is otherwise occupied let us put it that way um so the dark matter is the same thing as it, it's a it's a, a mass deficit on the cosmic cosmological scale All right. We were talking about that with Jack. Ah, I see Jack. Jack is here with us. So, Jack, if you uh, had any comments to make, you can unmute yourself and and comment on this uh, controversy of is matter energy is energy matter. I I will only say this. Let's go back to. Uh, Blackwood's general physics book from the 1940s and energy, the word energy is fairly new. It's only been around a hundred years. Um, and what they, the simple equation they use was energy is force times a distance. MA, a mass accelerated through a distance. Um, you can take every equation where someone sticks an E on the side and puts something else on the other side get rid of the E, solve for whatever they put on the other side, and all you come out with is mass accelerated through a distance. Uh, I agree with, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but I think Lou mentioned Borchardt. Is that how you pronounce it? If it's correct. Uh, he makes a simple statement, which uh, as soon as I read his, it, uh, that was one place where I really made a change in some of my thinking. He says, I can hand you a piece of mass, but I can't hand you a piece of energy. And the fire thing from the Greeks, those are photons. Um, just because someone had no knowledge of science made some sort of statement about this fire being an essence of the universe, um, that uh, modern science explains all of that stuff. And we don't need to go back 4,000 years to where people did no experiments and just made statements. Um, the statement of tension uh, and tension in water 
uh, that's just the, the molecules on the top of the water uh, attracting each other. I, this, that the universe is made of tension is really difficult to buy off on. Uh, I would suggest a person who I've listened to quite a bit, uh, Fernandez from India. Uh, he actually has shown what this elementary particle is that ether is made of. And another person, Xavier Borg, has got a pressure theory of gravity, which came up with the exact same number, which creates pressure and gravity. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, you hear people on all of the uh, TV channels saying this energy created something. Well, someone give me a description of energy that's actually an experiment where someone can show me something called energy. And every experiment uh, is nothing but particles interacting with each other and making new particles and, and basically mass. And if you use mass, frequency, radius, and charge, you can describe every particle ever known in the universe. You only need four things to describe it all. So I will quit at that because that should be controversial enough. Well, I'd be interested in if, if, if somebody's figured out what that uh, ether particle is, uh, what, what is it made out of? I think we'd all like to know. Uh, what it's made out of, uh, it's just mass. And it's a 186, 1 1.86 to the minus nine kilograms. It is so massive. You can't, uh, we have no technology to discover something that massive. And all he did was equate um, gravitational attraction to uh, charge. And this is the number you come up with. It just tells you this is the mass. When you equate gravitation to charge, this is the number you'll get. The, the mass of what? Because I just want to know if, if that person believes that there's an ether particle, then... Uh, he does, yeah. He, he calls it the hand of God stuff, and he does believe in ether. I think his whole site is based on ether, and it's his one, uh, 1.86 to the minus 9 kilogram particle is what he's calling ether. And his calculation is simply of two formulas, and the, the two equations make sense. Well, telling us how much the ether particle weighs is interesting, but it doesn't tell us what the ether particle actually is. I agree with that, and, and uh, it is so massive that uh, at this point in time, we have no technology for measuring it. Well, you said it was something to, to 10 to the minus 19 kilograms. That would actually no, make 10 it- to the, 10 to the, uh, I mean, sorry, 10 to the minus nine. Well, that would still be really, really small, right? Minus yeah, nine? Ex extremely small and extremely heavy. Um, it, you can simply go to Francis uh, Fernandez in India. You've got all of his uh, things on your website. Uh, the, he, he talked a lot in the past. Uh, maybe about five years ago was his last one. Go back and look at his articles. He puts all the mathematics in. Well, if you can type uh, the, a reference to the website in the chat, then uh, we could probably check it out. Um, you access the chat. Um, where do you type on here? I can find a place to type. Meeting notes. Uh, could I make a statement? Sure. Uh, I, 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 you know, it's, it's curious that the only things that we measure are those things that have mass. But I would presume that the ether and a lot of things in the universe do not have mass. So therefore, the very ether itself may be. Uh, components which are subdimensional are away from the actual measurements that we do have and that acting maybe like a superfluid superconductor would have particles that cannot be measured i would also uh, suggest that the ether itself as a stationary element maybe has no mass at all some parts of it do but then the parts that have no mass when they vibrate because of the component of a wave or motion uh, embedded in that structure would acquire mass. So therefore then the whole notion of mass is not something that is fixed. It is a variable component and it's acquired through motion. Though although some qualities of that being more compressed and more intense always have that mass because we're always able to measure. Them. So, uh, I'm not so sure that we can, like the Higgs boson, come in here and say this 
is definitely the one condition where mass exists. And uh, I, I, I see a great fallacy in that kind of thinking. What this guy may have discovered is no more different than someone claiming that the Higgs boson has mass. And therefore, at that level, because it's the smallest thing he could find, is the very component of the ether, because we assume that the ether is the smallest component, and it's not. So uh, with regard to uh, the structure, I personally feel that all particles are made from waves. Structures of waves, we focus on the particle. It's the, the wave structure has the property of mass. And basically, the very condition of the wave uh, it gives the quality where those waves interact and intersect gives the quality of the particle associated with the wave where we say, okay, this thing has mass. Uh, there is a gentleman here that passed away years ago. He came up with a theory called vector particle physics. I was very fascinated by that. And I kind of reinterpreted that as a uh, these vectors and uh, analysis of the particle as as a particle composed of superimposed waves. Okay, and uh, I I was involved in my own and looking at a photon. The most complex part of this theory, the photon. The wave component was a second dimensional uh, component quality. And that doesn't mean it doesn't have geometry. It's just the property itself was at a very low as opposed to mass. But then we think, okay, so the photon, uh, a second dimensional uh, uh, configuration, has no mass at all, which in, in a stationary, uh, uh, as we understand a photon, has no mass. But then as it moves or if it vibrates, it acquires mass. The very thing that hits your eye is something with mass. So then the photon itself has two qualities, a stationary quality where it has no mass, and then when it moves, it acquires mass. So then, and then you go to the uh, CERN experiment where you have uh, the, uh, the decay, decay channel to two photons. Well, you have something coming as, as a force collision, and then it's broken down to something where two photons, each photon having absolutely no mass, if you take the stationary quality of those configuration. So that experiment shows that we have something that had mass that two particles that have no mass. So the very idea that this particle collision identified that something had mass and it stayed to something that had no mass means that the very uh, idea of what caused mass was passed through in that experiment from mass to no mass. So we really don't know from CERN what causes mass. And just like in this guy's experiment, he's trying to assume that because he can detect a mass, that this is the smallest thing and therefore it is part of the ether. And that's nonsense, in my opinion. Did I make myself clear? All right, we, we did. So I uh, do have a request. So uh, uh, Akimbo, can you please make yes. sure to keep your microphone muted because we do hear a lot of noise from your microphone when you're not speaking. It's muted. Now I'd like to ask Jack and George whether they think space, space, they have talked about matter and they've talked about energy. I'd like to ask Jack and George what they think about space itself. Is it a substance? Or is it merely a container for matter and energy? Okay, can I speak to that? Yes, okay. please go ahead. I'm going to throw out some wild ideas from my own theory. Uh, I, I claim in my own theory that there are two waves in nature, time and velocity, and these two waves create everything. The, when they are combined, in as, as waves combine, um, a new wave, they're combined in two ways. They are scalar, where you see the various waves uh, over each other and they're added together. And then they actually combine and create a new wave. And that's like multiplication. That's what I call proper. So then if, if, if you can uh, re redefine physics in terms of two properties, time and velocity, then you've pretty much uh, 
qualified all the equations in transmutable and with and the, the very thing we call property is an a hieroglyph like what we say mass. So well, I think I the, were, question, uh, the question the question goes back to the universe. Okay. Uh, the ether is at its most simple level a uh, uh, simple wave structure. But I would presume that the uh, planets like the sun and the larger mass of them actually create space. And that this space reside under different kinds of space. space for the solar system and there's an electromagnetic field, which is another and totally different kind of space. So you might say that the space for gravity as we know it is plus dimensional type of ether. And when we get to the electromagnetic, it's a negative, it flips like plus and minus to a larger type of field. So that when we look at the ether, we assume that it's one thing. It could be very multiple types of ether overlaid against each other. And at the simplest level, this ether, which I would think of it as a fluid, it's like a net, maybe a net of photons or something this guy, this particle this guy's looking for. It's a net that goes out and the black holes create even larger nets. And some nets reside in larger nets. And the gravity changes between these nets. And, 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 and all of this is what I call qualified space because the space for our sun goes up into the heliosphere and stops. Then it resides in a larger space of the black hole. But all of this finite space resides within infinite space because dimensions as they go up and they rise we assume that everything from simplicity goes to complexity but in actual fact our it's the the universe is created in totally the opposite it's from complexity and infinite to the finite so you might say like your your own conscious mind it has an infinite idea of itself the space of the universe and the things we see are finite constructs within an infinite construct. Okay. So, so, sorry, George. So, my my so question I, is I think whether, I space, no. whether space is a substance or is merely a container for substances. Well, the container is something created within an infinite structure. And uh, I think in mathematics, to me, Euler's equation is the big thing. I would go with Pythagoras and say there's meaning in numbers, okay? So that you have all the numbers actually represent physical, physical properties, okay? So in, in my own theory, phi becomes velocity and phi hat one over phi is time. They combine together form the number one. That's a reference to a dimensional structure. You have two equations that can be proved in mathematics, additive and uh, multiplicative with phi and phi hat that produce one and negative one. If you go to Euler's equation, the product is a negative one. The negative one refers to a dimensional state or dimension or distance or radius, and that is can be broken down into time and velocity. So then now you we can understand that the entire universe as a wave-based construct created from outside the universe, all physical constants are with units are variable. The only reason that the gravitational constant is not a variable in our perception is because it's overlaid in four wave structures. So I, for me, the gravitational constant is one over time to the fourth power. So you got four levels of time superimposed together, and that minimizes the fluctuation of that constant. Those, those numbers that don't have units originate from outside the universe, like pi. So something from the outside of the universe in Euler's equation creates the construct of this universe. And this universe and all the things in it are variable, but they are constrained by how these two waves combine and through complexity, okay? So energy, we say, well, energy is a construct, it's a wave construct, but it's a dimensional part of it, e equals mc squared. It's a construct, but we can now look at, if we have two units, 
we can take an equation and interpret it more in more than one way now. Okay, we can uh, equation and the scale of the equation is determined by the constant. So we can determine, uh, look at our equations like two e equals mc squared. We'll have multiple applications, not just one understanding. Okay. So your your so theory I, is, is is highly based upon uh, waves, and yes. I've heard of uh, theories like that. But uh, the but the people would always ask, well, what what is it waving in? If, if, in what, order to have waves, you need a medium. So what what is the medium? Uh, I, I'm, okay, well the the medium is the wave itself, and it's generating the interaction of those waves generate particles, and its dependency is exists. On something it has to well, I, I think you're kind of doing the chicken and egg. I don't think you can say, say that the wave itself is the medium. If I have a bathtub and I'm creating waves, I don't think I could say that the wave, well, I'm, the I'm medium, not the wave gonna, was. Not, I will not presume what you know, outside the universe is actually generating the universe, but for me, that's what it is. And I would use Euler's equation as. And uh, but I will at anal analyze those wave structures are in the universe, okay? And those wave structures are multidimensional. The atom might be the supreme model for that. You have higher dimensions within the atom structure, and they they fold out into what I would call the ether, uh, what we see outside from space to the center of the atom, and we can define that dimensional structure we measure from maybe dimensions one through five, but there actually may be infinite number of dimensions that we can't see, but we can mathematically uh, calculate those and understand that gravity, something like gravity is something that is multidimensional. It carries through the dimensions as a particular type of force. and uh, so that it can be identified at various levels in this infinite structure. It recreates itself in the eighth dimension and it recreates itself again. You multiply it again, energy, the way we understand it does the same thing. So I could imagine that, <clears throat> you know, I was looking at Wikipedia, it said that when you get into the fourth dimension, that it's one over our cube. And I thought, hmm, that doesn't really work out. It doesn't, it's too asymmetrical to have a balance between objects. But the only way that gravity would change if we jump to dimension might we'd have to square everything. That's what I thought. It's pretty much a square. So force, the way we understand force, jump to square it, we go to dimension eight. And we can understand uh, and I'm I'm trying I'm not trying to whitewash you here. These things take time to explain. Uh, but uh, I think that going back to your, your first question, that the universe is multidimensional in terms of properties. And these properties we identify, we say mass is, if I could give you a code and say that T squared is density, you would say, well, that though the units don't matter. But in actuality, the property is the uh, quality of its composition of wave okay so i would say a certain wave configuration almost like a uh, periodic table in chemistry a certain configuration of electrons produces a certain property but we've confused the configuration of the physics uh, of, of time and velocity with some properties we'll say well that's mass okay but mass is simply in its most fundamental structure a composition of two waves so this whole universe is very simply based on basically two energies. And after I, I made that statement some time back, I was reading uh, on Hindu philosophy, and they said all the chakras were composed of two waves. So I found that highly interesting that they would claim something like that, and then I would see something similar to that in my uh, idea on how properties are evolved with uh, basic components. Okay, now when we get to the atom, we're dealing with more complex wave structures. Say so many electrons give an atom, so it's composition of neutron, and we go through and get all of these different uh, uh, 
uh, kinds of properties for the elements. But it's the same thing with the physical properties. And if there is a unified field theory, and I think it, it has to be, uh, it has to be based on an, the idea that certain ways together for physical properties. And they exist in two conditions. Uh, as one unit where things are multiplied, just think, all our multiplication is referring to a wave-based system where waves come together and they combine and they create certain properties. Well, let's get back to the let's get back to the the, the basic question that uh, Ikibo was asking, which is, is space an empty container, or no, is full. is space it's made full. out of something? It's the wave, so. the wave matrix, and it's solid full. It's full, and we're in a fishbowl. If you take my E equals m squared and you try try to create a hybrid equation, I I say d to the fifth equals m squared. Well, that's the same equation as the uh, the um, Schwarzschild radius. It's just going in the opposite direction. So you do that for the sun, the d it calculates to Neptune. If you take d squared, it goes to the heliosphere. So you have two constructs here. You have the, the space generated by the sun to Neptune and the space generated by the sun to the heliosphere. Okay, Those are two radiuses based on this Einstein equation. Now, but his equation is the opposite of the Schwarzschild radius. Okay, we're using different constants and it's going in a different direction. But I'm just saying that's one app understanding of that equation. Now, as the sun spins, okay, it's carrying the space it generates around it and it's creating a standing wave pattern. That's where the planet is. Okay. All right. Really? I, I don't need, is, does, does, uh, is, a, is Cabino trying to say something? You have a comment? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I think there's no more time left, but let me just uh, mention that um, both Einstein and some of his uh, writings and Newton mm -hmm. believed that space was substantial. I think there are physicists that uh, they call substantivalists. Who right. Believe that space, is, space is not empty. It's a substance on its own right. It's not just well, a container. I, I agree with you. Hey, I'm, 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 I'm trying to substantiate your first statement that it is. I'm saying that it's substantial, and I've just defined a, a structure, rudimentary structure to it, at two levels, at two types of ether, which cause the, uh, the way we see the orbits of the planets and how it, it flattens out to an ellipse, and how beyond that ellipse, the planets no longer rest in the eclipse, they spin off into these eccentric orbits. And uh, it's because the wave and the ether changes. After Neptune, that ether actually changes. And when we get beyond, I would presume when we get beyond the heliosphere, gravity goes one over R. Because we're no longer in the, the space generated by the sun, we've moved on to the space generated by the, um, the uh, black hole that we're in. Now, this does go to the one of the the email discussions I was showing you, to you earlier, which is uh, you know what is nothing, and in in this in this particular discussion, um, I was I was uh, adding the the idea, and this is this is actually an idea that lots of other people have come up with and given it different names, and that is that the substance of space is a positron electron C. Mm -hmm. And that's been called EPOS, EPOLA, I call it pos electrons. Um, it's actually uh, a fairly common idea that space in some way is a container, like the XYZ container, uh, one foot cube, that is a container. It's a container for this electron positron C. So, and that that is the, the, the substance which uh, the way the electromagnetic wave travels through. Since I don't very much prescribe to waves that basically mediate themselves, I always like to think of waves as being a compression and rarefication of some physical substance. So um, that, that, that is one possibility that's been going on in that discussion in that space is actually chock full of matter. I mean, some people have calculated that this stuff is like 
five million times denser than steel, which would make it the most dense substance in the universe, for example. But and, and that's why light travels through it so quickly because it has a great deal of tensile strength uh, being so dense. So that that's another idea that you might consider about you know what space is made out of. I think I saw an article just recently about uh, electron positive positrons uh, as virtual particles. Yes, there, it, the, they are mentioned in virtual as virtual particles, mostly due to the lamb shift experiment. And now that's where they carefully measure the spectra, let's say, I don't know, like hydrogen. And they find that there are these tiny shifts. And the only way they can figure out that those shifts actually exist is if the electron were moving through a sea of positrons and electrons. And what they say is that these positrons and electrons are virtual, that they pop in and out of existence. But I would say that the experimental evidence you know, doesn't say that they're popping in and out of existence. I think that the experimental evidence indicates that they are actually real and that uh, electrons moving and generating spectra are actually interacting with genuine positron and electron charges in space. So that, that was trying to go to that in the, uh, in the, in the email, the uh, argument that there is no evidence for uh, the ether. So I keep yeah, did, you, did you have something to say? Yes. Yes, um, if we go back to uh, prehistoric times, uh, during the time of Euclid, uh, when the earliest studies of what we are calling space today took place, uh, then we will come to the point, you come to the line, you come to surfaces. Um, what you call a point? We call a point a zero dimensional entity that doesn't exist. Or you say a point actually is not fictitious and exists. That was an argument in historic times. What is your own view about what the geometric point is? If it's a zero, if it's a zero dimensional entity, then uh, that would be the relationist uh, point of view. If it's not zero dimensional, wouldn't you think that is the fundamental substance, the fundamental unit of substance? That's a non zero dimensional point. Well, I think that anything that has physical matter, it does have a physical size to it. I suppose I, I'm a, a materialist in that if you, if you can pick it up and you can touch it, you know, like, like this pad of paper, that it has certain dimensions. And then if you were to go and divide this thing again and again and again until you got to the smallest thing, that it would still have a, a measurable dimension. Exactly. So I think I think the point has a measurable dimension of about the Planck size. Um, you subscribe to a line having no breadth. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with Euclid's definition, that lines don't have breadth. You subscribe to that. If you don't subscribe to that, then it means space itself is a substance. Because a line without breadth cannot exist. Yeah, a line with no breadth can only exist on a chalkboard as a mathematical concept. It, but in, 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 in reality, any line that you could draw in real space would have to have some breadth, I would think. Yes, so that's why I feel uh, maybe a little bit different from your own point of view, that space itself is a substance and not just a container. It is it's itself going to be Fundamental constituent is that geometric point. Well, this is uh, just uh, an idea. Well, I was arguing both things and that space is a container, but it's a container of an extremely dense sea of particles, which we recognize as space. So in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. Is it possible to be, um, to be okay, like, like if you look at um, an ocean, an ocean, the water in the ocean, the ocean is a, a container. It contains fishes. It contains so many animals, and it's also a uh, it's also the substantial content. The water inside the ocean is the content. 
So I am of the opinion that space itself is the water in the universe. It's not just a container, uh, like a like a bucket of water. So it's it's, a, it's a con content itself. The space is the content itself. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's why I, I would agree. I suppose you could say that the ocean sea bed itself is a container, though, right? The the Pacific Ocean is contained by the crustal uh, rocks of the Earth, uh, and that that is a container. Okay. If you remove the rocks surrounding the ocean, will the ocean cease to be a container? I suppose it could be just a big blob of water sitting in space all by itself. Yeah. <laughs> so, it could be a container. In that way, it, it, it would contain itself. It yes. would contain itself, just like in the space shuttle, we've seen them, you know, have these uh, blobs of water that they, that they squirt out and then they, they, they drink. They have yes. no apparent container. They kind of contain themselves. Yes. And Einstein uh, made reference to uh, that uh, one of his speech, one of his speeches, when he said space itself has physical qualities. I think that was the speech he made, made at uh, Leiden. University 1921 says space is endowed with physical qualities. It's not just a container. So, and that is what makes space able to transmit light, uh, mm -hmm. light waves. But there are so many other unresolved uh, difficulties with this idea. But I, I am of the opinion, which uh, you stated earlier, that a wave it's a disturbance in the medium, and space is that medium. Um, in some of my earlier discussions with um, uh, Corey, who was here earlier, uh, we are in agreement that such a medium must have solid qualities, which you mentioned, which, which you mentioned as well. Uh, if space is made up of points, and these points are, are tightly packed, because they cannot have space in between them, um, I think the criteria to be a solid like uh, medium is satisfied because uh, we can't have gaps between the points of space. So that criteria is satisfied uh, and can, it can behave like a solid like uh, a medium and transmit, transmit light as transverse waves with high frequency and high speed. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. Now I see that uh, Eric is showing us his lab. If you can, yes, if you guys, you can see that. Yes, Eric. I was wondering, Eric, uh, um, yes. I was wondering, Eric, Eric, had, Eric, Eric has a very interesting of experiment on the photon, and I think I'll let us hear from him. Oh, good, good, good. Thank you. Let me try to get this running here. I, um, let me, let me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Eric. Oh, good, good. All right. So I've been showing the oscilloscope, but let me point at the experiment itself. Where I have uh, a pair of detectors. You won't see it very well, but there's a lead shield and there's uh, two scintillators uh, receiving gamma rays. I'm going to try to get close. I have a thin detector in front of a thick detector, and there's a gamma ray source. Uh, aiming collimating gamma rays through and I have all this instrumentation where I have counters on top, uh, NIM modules, and the oscilloscope. The oscilloscope is the most important thing to see. So what is your experiment uh, doing? Yeah, um, it's, it's a test of the photon model. Test of the photon model. Right. It, if the photon model would say that uh, if it was a particle like a uh, photon, it would go one way or another at a beam splitter. So that's what that's what I'm doing. I'm splitting a gamma ray and seeing if it will go one way or the other or both at the same time. And so I'm doing a coincidence, a beam split coincidence experiment and looking at nanosecond timing between two uh, gamma ray pulses uh, and reading, I'm, my, the result of my experiment is that 
it defies chance. I'm seeing coincidences more often than chance. So what I have is these are the pulses from one detector and the pulses from the other detector. And this red thing is a histogram of the time between the two pulses. Uh, actually, what I'm doing is uh, we're making a square wave of, of the two channels and taking the time between those. Uh, so uh, on the time histogram, that's the most important part. That's the result of the experiment, this, this red peak. And I could uh, expand that in different ways. And, but it's it's just uh, starting, really. It, it it's a slow experiment. So, oh, so uh, can, you, have... can you can you explain again? Uh, so you what what is the theory that you're trying to test here? That a photon can do, can do what? That if I if I may come in, if I may come in, Eric has a website on quantum.net. U n q u a n t u m dot net. He has a lot of um, written material there on this experiment, but essentially he has been able to show that the particle view, he has been able to discredit the particle view of light in favor of the wave, wave uh, theory. Very good. That's right. So is light a particle then uh, being confirmed in this experiment? No, I'm showing that I defy the principle of the particle for light. If it was a particle, it would hold itself together to go to one detector or the other. And I'm showing that I could split to two detectors to make a two for one kind of effect because the gamma rays emitting one at a time. And I test that with a similar experiment and it's already known. The isotope I'm using cadmium 109 emits one gamma ray at a time. Planck's constant times frequency of energy. So I'm, I'm seeing full height pulses to show that there's two at a time that I can read in my detectors more often than chance. So I compare it to chance to see if light acts like a photon or not. Now, if I do the experiment with different isotopes or visible light, it looks like a photon. And that's why everybody says that. It's a difficult illusion to see through. A so, photon in what way? Is it a photon being a wave or photon being a particle? The, the definition of a photon, it's, it's a model. A, a definition of a photon is like this. It would go one way or another at a beam splitter. So like but, a particle, like a marble. Yes, but the photon model also includes wave properties. And therein lies the confusion and wave particle duality. And, and that's the way quantum mechanics is put together with its math, that there's both wave and particle uh, terms in our equations. Uh, but I'm, I do have a model that replaces quantum mechanics. It's, I, I can call it the loading theory. It's, it's an accumulation hypothesis. It's uh, something that you'll see in the beginning of our textbooks where they try to say, well, it's not a loading theory. They have you do a calculation. But they, there are problems with uh, this uh, loading theory interpretations in the past. It's a very old idea, the loading theory. It, 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 it started with uh, Planck in 1911. He did work on it. There are many greats who did work on it, but it's been suppressed and, and not treated uh, clearly in the past. So I did much work of historic, the historical analysis on that. But more importantly, I have a working experiment that shows that light does not, oh, at least it does not always obey the photon model. Well, well wouldn't, uh, I mean, the confusion here is that they're saying that light can be both a particle and a wave. 
which I would say is an inherently contradictory statement. Right. So, right. and I would say that there, there are a lot of experiments to suggest that light is a wave, you know, in particular, the interference type of experiments. So would, wouldn't someone just say that, oh, you're just showing this is the wave characteristic of light? No, I'm testing the particle property of light. This is an experiment that's been done many times before where they use this beam split and coincidence test to say that light really is photons. But I'm doing the experiment differently. I'm doing it with gamma rays to get the opposite result. I'm testing specifically the particle property of the photon model. So other experiments, they've done the beam split and they only pick up the gamma ray in one of the channels. So it's, no. it, acts, it acts like, I mean, I'm, I'm explaining the older experiments, right? No, no, you missed the point. The older experiments do not use gamma rays. I'm the only one that does this experiment with gamma rays. The but if you do it with uh, other than gamma ray, then you do see the particle nature, you're saying? Yes. Yes. If you use visible light, you get the illusion of particles. But it's just a random, it's, you're just looking at noise when you do that. You're just seeing a chance effect of it going from one detector to, or the other. But I'm able to go beyond chance. I'm able to see coincident detection rates that exceed the chance rate. That's what's important here. And no so one else what, what is your conclusion? Is light strictly a wave or, yes. or does it still have particle properties? The particle property of light is only at the instant of emission. There is such a thing as E equals H nu, or Planck's constant times frequency. Uh, but that's in the conversion from uh, uh, light to matter and matter to energy. There's, there are thresholds that happen. It's like light is emitted in a burst, and thereafter, it'll spread classically. But that initial emission, that's a particle-like thing, but it does not stay held together. And then for absorption, there's a threshold in absorption. So there's something particle-like in the conversion between light and matter. But light no. itself, I'm showing, is just a wave. Could I uh, interject with a thought? And you just tell me. Yeah. Uh, I, I have the idea uh, that, like you said, at the point of emission, it acts like a particle, but as it moves along, it acts like a wave. I was thinking of the ether, going back to the other gentleman's thought about the ether, that the ether is a sea of points of stationary photons. And then when the sun uh, bursts light, it comes off as a particle, but it, it crosses as a transverse wave, so that the ether is basically an elastic collision of billions of photons. And what we see at the receiving end is basically those photons that arrive at our eyes. They haven't traveled at all, uh, really. Uh, and uh, so what do you think of that? Does that kind of fit this scenario? No, no. That, that's very confusing. Look, is look, look yeah, look, I'm, I'm not trying to ask what the ether is. And mm -hmm. when, when you use uh, photon, it's, it's a model. And uh, it's very uh, confusing to explain uh, things with a broken model that's full of wave particle duality like photon. So I prefer to not explain things that way and be careful in our language. Uh, so I'm just taking a step, I'm taking a step backwards to do something that we can grasp with an experiment and just answer one, one question at a time. Like, what is light? Does it hold itself together like a particle or does it not? So we, we can have, Better, I call for better definitions of like particle and wave. Like the definition I use for a particle is that it holds itself together, but a wave doesn't. So there's a distinction between the two. Now, a photon is a model that has both. So it's 
it's right away too confusing to explain any kind of uh, world phenomenon with with photons. And, and as far as ether, uh, I'm I'm going to just leave it alone for now, and and just uh, say that light. Uh, I'm not. I'm not answering the question as to whether uh, light is going through an ether or not. I'm just eliminating the idea that light will hold itself together as a particle. You see. But doesn't uh, the idea of light being a wave, purely a wave, uh, kind of uh, force you to postulate an ether? That's okay. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, I mean, at one level, yeah. First, you say it's a wave. Now, what's the, what's 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 waving? I'm not worried about that. No, I, I'm yeah. not. Yeah. Okay. So experimentalist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know I'm, ether is, is such a dirty word that you don't even like to hear. You don't even like to to say it. And, uh, look, it's it's, it's all right. Go ahead and use the ether, but I'm not dealing with that. I'm I'm just I'm dealing with the wave particle duality paradox whether light is a wave or a particle. Well, Getting some understanding to the wave. Really wave with particle-like properties. Yeah, there are particle-like properties. That's what I'm addressing. I'm able to see the particle-like properties. These pulses from the yeah, detectors. It's, it's, it's just a pulse, a pulse of uh, EM. Well. And maybe it's a chirp. Maybe, maybe uh, the particle that the the the, uh, the the molecule that, or the the atom that generates it uh, is like uh, ringing a bell, and as it gives off its energy, the the frequency changes. But what you measure is an average frequency. That's where the energy HF the, the comes in. It's there's a, a there's frequency. a relationship between pulse height an electromagnetic frequency that's well established for these kind of detectors. So when we see a pulse height, we know it's related to some frequency. In this case, it's the frequency of the gamma ray I'm using. It's also the uh, duration too, right? The, 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 uh, the width of the pulse? Well, the, just the wavelength. No, no. The width, the width of the pulse is more from the detector. I'm, I'm not really counting that. People look at the area under the curve or the height of the pulse. The width of the pulse here is is very much distorted by the detectors. Um, look, well, I'm not I mean, sure I mean, about that. The all right. Of, well, we're getting close to the top of the hour here. So, Eric, I want to thank you for. Uh, that's good doing enough. Showing, showing your experiment, you got a lot of cool uh, instrumentation there. Right. So I do encourage anyone to look at uh, my Unquantum website. I do answer most of these questions that we've been discussing. And uh, I'd like to try this again sometime. But uh, I agree. Look, I, I'll let somebody else go on for now. So thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. So I'm going to try and uh, summarize here. And uh, Eric... And I would also invite anyone else that if you have a particular topic that you would like to talk about, perhaps give a demonstration of of um, what you would like to people to know, um, I would welcome that. You can send any suggestions to that to my email, franklinwho at yahoo.com. And uh, the next meeting we have, we can start off by uh, discussing what, uh, what, what would you like to talk about. So um, today's discussion I believe we started out uh, with Hans showing us uh, where he publishes all his stuff, which is docs.com. And we also discussed all the other places that uh, you can possibly publish. Um, one of my favorites is academia.com. Uh, there's also Vixra and there's LinkedIn, which is surprising because it's more of a corporate networking thing, but there, there are a lot of uh, good discussions, science discussions happening in LinkedIn. And uh, one of the biggest groups, use groups, is groups.google.com. And uh, you can go and check out like sci.physics uh, group in there. And the, the group that I moderate myself is NPA-relativity, 
where I am always shipping uh, discussions from the email threads that we have going around in the uh, CNPS. And uh, one of the threads that was going on is we were discussing about uh, what is nothing or basically what is space made out of. And uh, we went into the question of is matter energy? Is energy matter? How does that, how does that uh, go back and forth? And concepts about you know what is matter made out of? Uh, we heard some ideas that matter is made out of uh, wave interactions, or that you know matter is this hard little ball uh, as possibilities. And we then got into the whole question of what is space made out of. Since uh, we have these wave concepts going out there, the, the, there's always the question of what it is waving in. And um, so there was, there's some possibilities put out there, like uh, positron electron C is one possibility for what the space is made out of. And once we have something that can do waves, then perhaps uh, matter can be some superposition of these waves.